muscles, and we were talking about kind of general names who we give muscles based upon a particular action in a joint. So the prime mover and the synergist do what? If we're talking about the elbow joint. Prime mover moves muscle, the synergist helps move the muscle. Okay. So they create the action at the joint. So at the elbow, it would be. Alright, and then the antagonist would be the muscle that resists that. So for the shoulder, I mean for the elbow, it would be the tricep. And then because the origin of the biceps is on the coracoid process and the superior lip of the glenoid fossa for the biceps. Then we also have to have muscles that keep the scapula in place. And those muscles are called stabilizers. Okay. And then last time we went through uh, we went through lever systems. So remember we have three types of lever systems that all the joints in the body can be cut into. And they're all based upon where the joint is, the fulcrum, relative to where the muscle is, the effort and what is actually being moved, which would be the resistance. And so we have EFER for a first class lever, where we have fulcrum in the middle and effort and resistance on opposite sides. And in the second class lever, we have FER, where the fulcrum is here, the resistance is between the effort. And then in the third class lever, we, excuse this one was free, excuse yeah. And this one's fur. So in a third class lever, then we have the fulcrum of the joint here, and what exchanges is the rally position of the effort and the resistance. So then resistance and then effort. And so classic example of the elbow, classic example of, of the lento occipital joint, and classic example of no of the plantar flexion of the joint. I need more cup. <laughs> And then a uh, classic example of uh, extension and hyperextension hyper of the neck. <laughs> okay, so, so then yesterday we were talking about motor units in lab. We looked at motor units. So the critical point of a motor unit is what understanding a motor unit. Why is it important for you guys to know a motor unit and how that affects activity of a muscle? Right, so at the motor unit level, if a signal is sent by the brain, then all muscle cells within the motor unit, all myofibrils within the motor unit, all sarcomeres <coughs> within the motor unit, all fully contract. So at the motor unit level, there is no such thing as a partial contraction. So the way muscles partially contract is that you don't recruit all motor units. So if you have a partial contraction, not all the motor units are contracting. As you move from a partial contraction to a full contraction, then all the motor units are recruited, right? So the motor unit is how we explain how muscles can do partial contractions. Then we talked about the types of contractions that can occur, that occur. So if we're thinking about this relative to what we were just talking about in terms of uh, the movement at the elbow, then the prime mover and the synergist would do which of these contractions? A concentric isotonic contraction. The antagonist would be doing what kind of contraction? An eccentric isotonic contraction. And then the stabilizers would be doing what kind of contraction? Isometric. So, so the three types of contraction are help us explain kind of what's going on when we're creating action. If we have to stabilize a bone in place, then the muscles keep the bone from actually being moved, but they aren't shortening to move the bone. So if a muscle has an increase in muscle tone, but it's not shortening, then it's a isometric contraction. Where the biceps and brachialis are physically shortening to, 
to flex the elbow. So they're doing concentric contractions. The triceps has tone, but it's actually not being shortened. It's actually being elongated, which makes it a eccentric isotonic contraction. That's just looking at how those could be looked at within a joint itself. Okay. Then what we did in lab on Monday and turned in yesterday was a lab where we were looking at some of the principles involved in, in muscle contraction. So this graph is called a myogram because it's a graph of the physical activity of the muscle. Okay. So if we know that the muscle was stimulated here, it appears the muscle is doing nothing, but in reality, it's actually doing something, isn't it? <clears throat> so it's called a latent period. So, so one of the points of the homework was to get you to think about that. So if we go to lecture two for a moment, and we look at these steps, Then, if we're going to put steps under the latent period, contractile period, and relaxation period, where, do you, where would you put these first five steps? Yeah, they're all in the latent period. And the key to it is the fifth one, that we have to have calcium binding and propane to free up our cross bridge binding sites to make a muscle physically begin to contract. So why the muscle doesn't respond is because it physically can if troponin and tropomyosin are still in place. And we have to have the calcium bind cause a change in, in bond angles that causes a molecule to change its shape and frees up uh, the cross binding sites between the active and minus. All right, so then uh, which so we've already done the linkage period. So which of these would you put in the contractor? So six or eight for sure, because all we actually have is we have the cross bridges connecting. We're using ATP. We're using the kinetic energy free from ATP to create a power stroke and pulling the active toward the center. So nine is the interesting one. And so. If we look at 9 and 10, where would you put 10 before we go away from this? So 10 is certainly in the relaxation period where we're, we're beginning to, to carry calcium back in a sarcoplasm. <coughs> and troponin returns to its pre-calcium shape, which prevents optimomyosin from interacting again. So the muscle can't physically continue to contract. Okay. So 9 is an interesting one. And so, so what I tried to do in lab, and I just wanted to review real quick with you, is, is uh, trying to, to reconcile the difference between the physical activity of the muscle itself and the membrane activity that's occurring on the muscle itself. So up here, the red one is a myogram. So a myogram is a graph of what's happening physically with the muscle, right? So the blue one is actually, the blue graph below it is actually a graph of the membrane potential, right? So a flat line means the membrane's at rest. An upward swing means the membrane is undergoing a depolarization. And a return back to the flat line means the membrane has to go back to a repolarization. So where is repolarization occurring? So it's kind of right at the boundary of the latent period that can run. Okay. So I, I would accept either one. What I wouldn't accept is the relaxation period. Because you have to close the calcium channels, pick up enough calcium to make troponin and tropomyosin return their original shape before a muscle can physically begin to Relax, okay? Okay. 
So, what's the difference between unfused tetanus and fused tetanus in terms of stimuli? The, the stimuli are more frequent, or the time frame between stimuli is shorter. And how does that really affect it? When the stimuli are longer, why does that create the bump line? Because it gives the muscle time to pick up the calcium, to, which allows it to relax somewhat. Very good. Yeah, so what we've done is we begin, the membrane is repolarized. We've collected our calcium, troponin and tropomyosin returned to its original shape, and the membrane and the muscle began to relax. And then when we stimulate it again, then we recruit more motor units, and the second contraction is a harder contraction. So you, you, you do the stair step, and so you keep doing the stair step. So why did the stair step disappear in fused tetanus, where we get this, this straight line going to a maximum contraction at the top? Yeah. So, so because the time frame between stimuli was shortened, the subsequent stimuli are all now occurring during what period of muscle activity? Contractile period. So the muscle is never allowed to try to relax. So it just creates a strong, strong, steady contraction. Does that make sense? <laughs> all right. So now let's talk about how a muscle can actually create the force to move uh, the appendage. Okay. And so we can, we can kind of think about it from uh, the lab on Monday where I actually connected someone to the physiograph and we began to get the muscle to contract and eventually lift the arm. So when we were playing around with the strength of stimulant. I got the muscle so you can see it actually physically contract here. You can see the shortening occurring in the, in the forearm, but the arm didn't move, right? Right. So what happens is as all of the sarcomeres shorten and all of the myelofibril shorten within the muscle, that shortening creates a force. And that force is referred to as internal tension. So it's the it's the force created by the shortening of the sarcomeres. Okay. So what we did yesterday is we talked about how the epimyceum is continuous with the tendons, the perimyceum is continuous with the tendons, and the endomyceum is continuous with the tendons. So in essence, we have a muscle that's somewhat constructed like a hammock in which the muscle cells are entwined in the hammock. So what you have to do is you have to create enough internal force that you transfer that force to that connective tissue. And the force that's transferred to the connective tissue is called external force. Okay. And so for you to accomplish picking something up, you have to recruit enough motor units in your muscle to create enough internal force to actually transfer enough external force to overcome the resistance, okay? And so when we were first figuring out how much stimuli we needed to recruit a few motor units so we could actually see the muscle bulge a little bit, we weren't, we hadn't recruited, we hadn't recruited enough motor units to actually create enough external force to overcome the resistance, which would be elevating the arm, right? So then what we did is we, we then went to uh, unfused tetany and toward fused tetany using multiple stimuli, and then eventually we could pick the arm up because we recruited more motor units, which increased internal tension. As we increase internal tension, we will increase external tension. And as soon as external tension is greater than resistance, then the, the arm will move. Yeah. That's, the, that's what your brain does every day. Well, every, make, every move you make, the brain has to calculate how many motor units 
are going to be required to accomplish that particular task. It's all based upon a history of activity based upon what the resistance is going to be. Okay? Does that make sense? Somebody have a question? Does the tissue surrounding the muscle fold when it contracts or does it squish? So you mean the endomycin? Yeah. So, so what happens is each sarcomere shortens, the myofibril shortens, and that's the internal tension. And then that creates tension on the tendons. So the tendon of origin is the stationary point. So it has some external tension on it. And so we would have to use stabilizer muscles to keep that in place so it doesn't go anywhere, right? Which transfers most of the external tension to this bone. So as the muscle okay. as the muscle is shortening, uh, within the elastic fibers there are these uh, elastic elements and they actually uh, cause the connective tissue to actually shorten with the muscle itself. So that's what we were looking at yesterday when we were looking at the slide. We were, we were looking at the idea that we have this connective tissue, the epimycin, uh, becomes continuous with the tendon. We have this internal connective tissue. We can see here this becoming continuous with the tendon. So as a cell shortens, it creates an increased tension in this compartment or environment. So we call that internal tension. And because all of the connective tissue is all interconnected, then we transfer that shortening of the muscle to the connective tissue, and that's what we call external tension. And then as we know, what happens is the muscle was longer when it was stretched out, and the muscle shortens appreciably as it contracts. And that's what creates the leverage, and then the joint creates the leverage. So one thing that's fascinating is that your brain has to know where you are actually starts. The brain has to know the difference between your arm being down here and your arm being here if you're going to start a contraction. And so there are all these signals coming from your body that go to your brain all the time that give you spatial orientation in terms of where your, your arms are. If you think about it, you can close your eyes and you know exactly where your arm is at any point in time. So the way we know that is that built into muscles and built into tendons, there are receptors that are going to respond to this change in internal tension within the muscle itself, and then this exchange, this change in external tension within the, the tendons themselves. So within the muscle, we have a, a, a sensory apparatus called a spindle, a muscle spindle. And it detects the dynamic and static changes in muscle length. So it's responding to the muscle changing its length, which is that internal tension. Okay. And then within our tendons, we have tendon, tendon Golgi organs, uh, which monitor the external tension created by the muscle. And we use that to know where appendages are at any point in time. But we also use it to your brain uses it to interpret the strength of contractions that are actually occurring. So it helps prevent damage during exercise by creating excessive force. So it's really kind of interesting. So this morning, uh, there, was a, there was a paper that was just released that was kind of interesting. So they were interested in how people learn music. And so they were interested in and they had a bunch of uh, people bring in their favorite CD of one of their favorite musics. And then they would play it, and then they would sing it, and then they would have them sing it from memory uh, without hearing it while they were playing it. And then they actually were scanning the brain to see what area of the brain was actually involved in this memory process. And when they started the experiment, they thought that because music is auditory, that it would be the area of the brain 
that we use typically for auditory interpretations that would actually be active. And what they found was it was the motor cortex and what we typically use to coordinate muscle activity. And so what they theorized is that because learning a sequence, learning a song is learning a sequence, and the motor cortex is, an, is the expert part of your brain for sequential activity, and that it actually has to remember sequences of muscle contractions all the time to accomplish a task like tying shoes and stuff. So, so it was really kind of cool. And if, if you tie that to dance, then, then it all obviously makes sense. Because when you hear music, and those are motor skills. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I think it was just came in uh, the <laughs> All right, so. So we have different tasks for different muscles in our body. So. The muscles that allow us to stand direct all day are doing what kinds of contractions? Isometric contractions. But they're doing isometric contractions all day long. So they have to be fatigue resistance. Otherwise, you'd be walking down the hallway and you'd fall into a blob because your muscles would fatigue and you couldn't maintain your body position. All right. So we have other muscles that we use to grab things and to manipulate things. And what we need is fairly quick muscle contractions for those. But we don't expect to do that for periods of time. Then we have muscles in our legs that have to have quick contractions but have to have endurance. So what we end up with when we look at, when we look at a muscle is that there are three types of skeletal muscle cells that can comprise the muscle. And it's the relative abundance of particular cells that explains why arm muscles versus leg muscles versus those postural muscles have some unique attributes. Okay. So what we have, when we look at a slide, is we have cells that are larger staying dark, we have cells that are intermediate in staining, we have cells that stay light. Uh, and so, what they've done is they've incorporated into the name of the cell, whether it's a fast twitch muscle or a slow twitch, meaning that it can do a rapid contraction or a fairly s slow sustained contraction. So we have slow oxidative fibers, we have fice like the lytic fibers, and we have fast oxidative like the lytic fibers. So the first part of the word is just the contractibility control. Second part of the word is actually how they are deriving energy to do power strokes. Okay. And so the way in which we typically produce ATP is by oxidating a glucose molecule. All right. So oxidative fibers have a capacity to use glucose rapidly to generate a lot of ATP. And the word oxidative tells us something about that component, that it requires oxygen. So glycogen and glycolytic uh, and glycolysis uh, are all words that kind of start with the same sequence. So, so glycogen is a storage molecule for sugar that's unique to muscle. Okay. Um, glycolysis is the first step of uh, beginning to break down a sugar molecule to make ATP. And it is, uh, it can occur in the absence of oxygen. So the glycolytic component is actually telling us how ATP is being produced. Okay? So the words are descriptive. And then different people have different words for these. So if you went into sports medicine, you went into kinesiology, you go into exercise physiology, everybody has their own little words for them. So from a biology standpoint, we, we always use oxidative, oxidative, and glycolytic as a way of interpreting that production of ATP. So then there are acronyms for that. So slow oxidative is so, fast oxidative is fog, and then fast glycolytic is FG. 
And then other people just use a, a numbering system. So the type 1 fibers are slow oxidative fibers, or slow twitch fibers, which is where T comes from. And then fast oxidative fibers are type 2A fibers, and fast oxidative fibers are type 2 fibers. So the numbering system, one is a slow contracting fiber, two are fast contracting fibers, and then they use 2A and 2B to separate the two types of fast contracting fibers. Fast contracting fibers from one another. So that's kind of the naming system that's been used. So hemoglobin is the molecule that we, we need in our blood to be able to actually carry oxygen to our tissues. And without hemoglobin, the oxygen level in our atmosphere is not high enough that we could actually exist as a consumer of O2 at the rate we are we'd have to be real dinky to be able to accomplish it. So without hemoglobin, we wouldn't live on Earth. We couldn't carry enough oxygen in our blood, so we'd have to reduce our size so we could, so we could diffuse oxygen across the surface of our body. So because of that, as we go from a period where we're at rest, where our blood is highly oxygenated, to a period where we're under load because we're exercising, then we, we, could, we reach oxygen depths in our blood at a more rapid rate. So to overcome that, we have a molecule similar to hemoglobin that is uniquely found in muscle, and it helps us store oxygen. So it's called myoglobin. So myo for muscle, globin from the fact that it's globular protein. Uh, and so myoglobin actually helps us store oxygen in tissues. And it's, it's uniquely found in muscle. Uh, and so what we see is that oxidative fibers, because they require higher amounts of oxygen, uh, have lots of myoglobin, so high myoglobin levels. And fast glycolytic fibers, because they typically don't, depend upon high amounts of oxygen. oxygen, don't have high amounts of myoglobin. So one of the differences that separates type 1 and type 2A fibers from type 2B fibers is the presence of myoglobin and the extent of myoglobin within the tissue itself. Right? So the thing that always fascinates me when I think about it is that we think, we think intuitively, oh man, we need oxygen. Uh, to live. But there's only one organelle in your body that uses oxygen. And that is mitochondria. So we have a respiratory system, if you want to reduce it to the simplest statement, we have a respiratory system that's designed to feed our mitochondria oxygen. Right? So if you have a higher amount, if you use oxygen fast, you have a high amount of myoglobin stored oxygen, then you can have a lot of mitochondria to use the oxygen. So the connection we see is the higher levels of myoglobin, the more mitochondria that we see in the cells. So again, type 1 cells have many mitochondria, type 2 cells have many mitochondria, and type 2A cells have many mitochondria. Type 2B cells lack a high amount of mitochondria. They have a lower amount of mitochondria because they don't have as much capacity to store oxygen and use oxygen. And mitochondria is the only place that oxygen is used. All right. So how do we get the the oxygen that we put into our blood in our lungs to our muscles? And that's what our circulatory system helps us with. So we have a part of a heart that pumps the blood and pumps it to our muscles. And we exchange in little tiny, with little tiny blood vessels that are networks of blood vessels that we call capillaries. So that's where exchange actually occurs. So if you have a lot of mitochondria to use oxygen, you, ha you have the capacity to use oxygen and store it, then you would also have to have a lot of capillaries to allow that exchange to actually occur. So hand-in-hand, hand, with many mitochondria, high myoglobin, or many capillaries. 
contributing capillaries, <coughs> many capillaries. And in fast glycolytic fibers, we have few capillaries because they don't consume oxygen at the same rate. They make ATP in a different way. So what's amazing is myoglobin actually changes the color of the cell. And when you have more capillaries, you have more blood in the, in the tissue, and that changes the color of the, cell, of the tissue as well. So typically, muscles high, with high in slow oxidative fibers are going to be very red in color. So in a couple of weeks, we'll all be eating turkey. And when we think about turkey, we think of, what do you want, light meat or dark meat? And now you know something about dark meat. Turkey's thighs and legs uh, are going to have a lot of these oxidative fibers. Because yeah. they'd rather run them. If you ever hunt turkey, you don't want to run them on the ground. Right? So same way over here, high myeloma, many mitochondria, many capillaries, and these are red. So these two uh, create what we would call the dark patterns. And then uh, fast light ability with few capillaries are very pale pink, or what we would say is white. White. Yeah. So, and then what's cool when you begin to understand this is, is then if you look at different animals, like uh, if you actually looked at um, a chicken versus a, a duck. And because ducks fly all the time, their breast meat is not light like a chicken or a turkey because they're more dependent on flight for what they do. So it's kind of interesting. So years ago when I was working as a wildlife biologist, I'd run some crews that had uh, college students in the summertime that would collect data with. And uh, so at the end of every summer, I'd always have a wild, wildlife feed school. And also along I collect different things that uh, we could have at the feed. So so one year I was trying to move a beaver that had been clogging a culvert, flooding this road all the time. So I was trying to live trap this beaver to move it. It took me about four and a half weeks playing a game with this beaver to actually catch him in the trap. So when I finally caught him in the trap, his head got caught in the trap and drowned. Uh, I was trying to, to live trap him and move him and make him happy in a new home and he around and said, so what am I going to do with this? Oh, the wildlife feed. And so I skinned the beaver out and fed people beaver. <laughs> and it was the darkest meat I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it was like dark because they swim underwater all the time. So I need a high capacity uh, storage of oxygen to do that. So high myoglobin levels. And high levels of my gut. Yeah. And then the meat had that real metallic taste to it. So if you hold your breath a lot, does that mean you're going to develop more? No, we're going to talk. <laughs> you can play a little game with distribution of muscle fibers, uh, but you can't do a lot. So a big part of it is how you were genetically uh, predisposed. So oxygenating and glycolytic refer to how we make ATP. Oxidative fibers can generate a lot more ATP than glycolytic fibers. So slow oxidative fibers, even though they can make a lot of ATP, actually do slow contractions, which means they're doing fewer power strokes per unit time. So they don't use ATP as readily. Fast oxidative fibers, because they're doing rapid contractions, are, you do, are using a high amount of, of uh, power strokes per unit time to accomplish that. So they are high consumers of ATP. So they, they, they have fast re ATP hydrolysis. And all, of, all the word hydrolysis says is break down ATP. So what we do is we make ATP, and then to recover the energy, we break it back down to ADP plus phosphate. So the word hydrolysis it just simply means you're going from ATP to ADP plus phosphate. Okay. And if fast glycolytic fibers do not have the capacity to generate high amounts of ATP, but they consume high amounts of ATP. So they're kind of like our our present economy where we 
we consume more resources than we have. And so they build debt. Okay? Over time. Right. So slow oxidative fibers uh, have slow contractile speed, is what the slow is telling us. Fast oxidative fibers have a fast contractile speed. Fast glycolytic fibers have a fast contractile speed. So that's what fast and slow was telling us originally. Well, if you can store a lot of oxygen, but you use your resources wisely, because you have a lot of storage, but you don't use it all at one time, then you are a very fatigue resistant fighter because you don't run into oxygen death quickly. If you're a fast oxidative fiber, you have the capacity to generate large amounts of ATP uh, and you can store some oxygen, but you aren't using it as effectively, so you can, you can extend this contractile period for a while, but you eventually enter death at the end of it. So they're intermediate fatigue resistant fibers. Fast glycolytic fibers are the fibers that have limited resources to begin with, but consume resources rapidly, so they enter debt very quickly, and so they're very low fatigue resistant fibers. So within our muscles, we have this uh, combination of fibers that can, that can contract quickly, but uh, quickly go into debt versus fibers that can contract quickly for longer periods of time, versus fibers that contract slowly for longer periods of time and don't enter debt, right? And so when we eat sugar, uh, the first thing that our body does with sugar is store it as a sugar molecule because we can, re we can recover uh, it, put it back in our blood more quickly. So when we take in glucose, <coughs> and we have an abundance of glucose, what we do is we convert the glucose to glycogen. And then glycogen is how we store sugar. So if we look at our body overall, the liver and skeletal muscle is where we store most of our glycogen. Okay. So the way your body works is if you have a bunch of sugar, you're going to make glycogen. If your muscles are full of glycogen, your liver is full of glycogen, then you're going to stir it, then you're going to take the sugar and store it for a longer period of time, and you're going to store it as lipids. Okay. And so slow oxidative fibers have like low slow excuse me, low glycogen stores because they don't use ATP at a rapid rate. Fast oxidative fibers have intermediate glycogen stores because they use ATP at a more rapid rate but have an abundance of oxygen and capillary investment to continue to get new resources all the time. So fast glycolytic fibers have to have the highest glycogen stores because they don't have the resources to make ATP quickly with oxygen and will quickly convert to using, to making ATP without oxygen. And so they need a lot of sugar to accomplish that. And the reason is, is that if we have a so in the presence of O2, what we can do is we can take the sugar, we can oxidize it in the cytoplasm of the cell of the mitochondria, and we can make 38 ATP per glucose molecule if oxygen is present. So if oxygen is not present, then what we're going to do is we're going to oxidize a glucose molecule, but we're not going to use mitochondria because mitochondria is what requires oxygen. oxygen. So it's going to occur in the cytoplasm, and we can make two ATP per glucose molecule. So why do fast glycolytic fibers have the largest stores of glycogen? because they're so ineffective at making ATP efficiently that they begin to make two ATP per glucose molecule. So if you were going to, if you were going to design an exercise routine to lose weight, which of these three fiber types would you want to focus on? 
fast glycolytic fibers. Because then you'll burn a lot of sugar <coughs> to get the adequate ATP you need. Voila. Okay. Isn't that, that's pretty cool, isn't it? All right. So these are just some graphs showing what we were just talking about in terms of the contractibility of the muscle and the fatigue pattern of the muscle itself. So FG fibers are fast glycolytic, fast glycolytic fibers or those type 2B fibers. So remember they have they have high glycogen stores but low myoglobin stores, low uh, capillary investment and low mitochondrial investment. So they have rapid capacities to contract, but ineffective ways of making ATP. So they actually are the fastest of all of our contractors in terms of how much force they can make per unit time. So that the top graph is really speed. But this is a fatigue graph, and look what happens. Boy, they fatigue quickly because they use up their oxygen real quickly and then convert to that two ATPs for glucose molecule. And so that makes it fatigue real quickly. So phallic fibers were fast oxidative glycolytic fibers. Even though they use ATP quickly, they have abundant myoglobin, abundant mitochondria, and abundant capillary investment, which allows them to gain resources uh, in terms of oxygen and sugars from the blood at a more rapid rate. And so their fatigue curve is extended way out relative to what we see with the fast oxidative fiber. So if we look at a slow oxidative fiber, which has a high investment in myoglobin, a high capillary investment, and a high mitochondrial investment, but uses ATP at a much slower rate per unit of time, then those fibers are slow contractors. So the peak at which the force occurs is very slow, but they can contract for extended periods of time. And so, and without fatigue. So which of these fiber types would you want in postural? Let's use all day long. Slow oxygen. Slow oxygen fibers. And so that's what we're beginning to try to put together is how in the world uh, do you use these? And so what we're going to see is that slow oxidative fibers are the most abundant in postural muscles. And we tend to want to use them uh, when we have an involvement for endurance activities. Fast oxidative fibers are the most abundant in the leg muscles. Uh, and that's involved in running and sprinting where we do a higher contractibility rate, but still a fatigue resistance. And then fast glycolytic fibers are more abundant in our muscles uh, where we depend upon very rapid actions to do things, but we don't, we don't plan to do long sustained contractions with those muscles. And, and they're the most abundant, but they have the shortest uh, duration activities because of the intensity. So if you were walking across the rope bridge in the Amazon over a canyon that's a thousand feet and the rope breaks, what muscles would you want to do to quickly grab the rope? Your fast glycolytic fibers in your hands. So now you grab the rope and you're thinking, oh my god, I didn't fall. Are you going to want to hang there until somebody gets you with just your own muscles? No, because then you're going to fall, so you want to incorporate leg muscles somehow into the activity, right? To to make sure you can hang onto that rope for a longer period of time. Yeah. So recruitment, remember, is how we go from uh, a single motor unit to two motor units to three motor units, that recruitment process that the brain does. And so if you think about that, you would want to recruit the fibers that can contract for long periods of fiber, long periods of time first. Then you would want to recruit your, your fast oxidative fibers second. And then, the, and then your fast glycolytic fibers third in a mix of fiber types and muscle cell. Yeah. Just to try to 
to extend the contractibility of, of the muscle of the cell. So when we look at fiber types uh, and performance, then power athletes like sprinters uh, would possess high type, high percentage types of fast fibers, right? So fast fibers. Endurance athletes like distant runners uh, would need a higher percentage of slow fibers. And so then when you look at athletics, particularly at the Olympics, you don't see the same person who, who runs the marathon running the sprints. Because we were all genetically endowed with a fiber combination that enhances our ability to do certain types of tasks. And that's why some people are excellent splinters, sprinters, and other people are more endurance athletes. So it's pretty amazing. And then others like weightlifters and non-athletes have about a 50-50 ratio. Okay. Um, so you know, you can look back through history and look at a lot of things that have happened and begin to think about, you know, why there is this variation. So here's one, because tur turkey day is coming up. So, so what we do in, uh, in agriculture is we do what we call selective breeding. And by doing selective breeding, we can, add, we can enhance certain attributes of, of animals. So if we had a turkey that was an incredibly good flyer and runner, then it would not have as big a breast material with nice white meat. And people who like white meat would not like that turkey. So what we have to do is genetically play around with, with breeding to get a turkey who actually has larger breast mass for people who like white meat. So there is actually a turkey that they call the large breasted turkey because it's been genetically over time bred to have much larger breast meat and less legs. And there are other people who think that all the bones in a turkey are problematic. And you know, I'm just wasting my money buying bones. So they've also been breeding turkeys to reduce their <laughs> skeleton. Investment. So pretty soon we'll have lob turkeys <laughs> that can't move around. Right? <laughs> yeah, turkey, yeah, domestic turkeys have quite a bit more re reduced uh, uh, mobility compared to wild turkeys, yeah. and particularly the the big breasted turkeys because they are, even though they've got all this mass, they're not good flyers compared to a wild turkey. Mm -hmm. So anyway, interesting. So through time, the thing, the same things happen to, to humans. Is, you know, where the selective pressure has been altered, uh, patterns and all sorts of larger breasts and little bones. So endurance and, and resistance training cannot change fast fibers to slow fibers, fast fibers to slow fibers, but we can play a game with with the two type B and A fibers. So we can make a shift from type 2B to type 2A. So type 2B were what kind of flavors? Fast. They fast off speed or fast glycolytic? Mm -hmm. They were fast glycolytic fibers. So we can convert some of our fast glycolytic fibers to fast oxidative fibers. And that, by doing that, we would improve endurance. Yeah. So that's what, that's what people who train all the time specifically do is they can convert some fibers to another type to enhance their endurance. So like uh, bicycle riders, except uh, they also apparently <coughs> use a lot of drugs to help with the conversion process. <laughs> I used to use like the Lance Armstrong as an example. Now we know Lance helped himself out with the process. So in other words, we really can't type, change our type 1 fibers or slow oxidative fibers. But what we can do through training is convert more of our fast glycolytic fibers to the fast oxidative fibers. And improve endurance and exercise. So the other dilemma we have 
is that uh, the aging process, if, if you remember the laws of thermodynamics, the aging process said that all systems go from a high state of organization to a more loosely, loose state of organization, and we call that process entropy. Right. So, so when I look at the aging process, what I see is an increase in entropy. So we invest a bunch of energy trying to prevent ourselves from moving toward entropy. And as we age, we get less good at doing that. So our body just doesn't do things as well as entropy increases. Well, that's true of muscle mass. So, so when you're young, you can build muscle mass and you can maintain muscle mass much more easily. And then at the end of that youth period, where you have the capacity to increase muscle mass and maintain it, then you're going to begin to decline in muscle mass. And then what becomes important was, what was your muscle mass at the point where it began to decline? And so well, what, what actually happens is the rate of, of loss of muscle mass increases at 50. So that's, it appears to be kind of a magic date. So you want, to, you want to reach a muscle mass level and maintain it before 50 because that's where you're going to start declining from. And so if you don't have a lot of muscle mass at 50, you're going to lose uh, muscle mass. And that's why we see some elderly people who actually have trouble even walking very far and stuff. Because they really just they deny a lot of muscle mass. You could, after 50 though, you can still build it up, but you need Now, usually at 50, 50 but you, you, you can't, muscle mass is harder to build at 50. But with exercise, you can decrease the rate of loss. So you can't really stop the loss, but you can decrease the rate of loss. And that's why exercise becomes more critical as you age, maintaining uh, body mass with bones that we talked about and with muscles. Yeah. And then what you see in elderly people is they get cold on them. Like my mother-in-law comes over and she wants the furnace at 90. You know, I would have to run around in my swimsuit at 90 in the middle of the winter. But she doesn't have any muscle mass. And it's muscle mass that creates your body heat that, that you use to maintain body temperature. So as elderly people lose muscle mass, they have more trouble regulating body temperature. They get colder and colder and colder. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to talk about this ATP thing and kind of go through, well, wait, how come this occurs? And, you know, what's different here than here? And so what I call it is the mathematics of ATP. So you probably get cellular respiration in biology. I'm less interested at this point that we know the intermediates and that. And I'm more interested in just tracking kind of where it where the ATP is made and how we come up with the magic number of beans, okay? So I call it ATP math. All right. So the first thing that's kind of cool about muscles is they have a unique molecule called creatine that can be phosphorylated. And so when your muscles are at rest, you can use your mitochondria to make ATP. ATP is not a great way to store energy, which is why we store energy as glycogen and fat. And so what we want to do when the muscle is relaxed is generate ATP using sugar. Then we want to take the phosphate off the ATP and attach it to creatine, create this creatine phosphate. Because then we can store the energy in that molecule better. And that frees up some ADP so we can make some more ATP to phosphorylate some more creatine. So that's kind of the cycle when we're resting is we're using sugar to make ATP. We're converting the ATP, one of the phosphates off the ATP, putting it on creatine to create this creatine phosphate molecule. And then we can store energy. So basically, when you first initiate a contraction, independent of what type of muscle fiber we were just talking about, we're not actually going to use ATP to accomplish the power stroke. Well, well, excuse me, we are going to use ATP to come to the stroke. But what we're not going to do is generate new ATP through, the product, through sugar in a normal pathway because we can quickly make new ATP off of creatine phosphate. So that when the muscle begins to contract, it's going to use ATP 
uh, for power strokes, but you're going to make your new ATP from creatine phosphate. And so that is how we accomplish very quick contractions, and we don't have to, we don't actually have to generate ATP uh, the harder way by breaking down a sugar molecule. So what's unique to muscle is this ability to store creatine phosphate. So you can go to a health food store and you can buy bottles of creatine, uh, and then people consume it as a supplement, and that maximizes their capacity to store energy in muscles. The only problem with it is creatine is highly water soluble, so you can pee it out like crazy. <laughs> so, so if you're not very low in creatine to begin with, then you're essentially just peeing all your money down the <laughs> toilet because it's, it's, it's very, very soluble. In fact, when we do the kidney, what we're going to do is talk about how clinically we use a, clear, a creatine clearance test to determine kidney function <laughs> because it is so readily moved into your, your <coughs> blood. Okay. But you do want to have adequate creatine levels to, to accomplish this storage. Okay? So once we've done some initial contraction, then what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to have to make ATP from something else because we've created all of our creatine phosphate back to creatine. So then what we're going to do is begin to break that muscle glycogen down, which is the way we store large chains of glucose. And we're going to break it back down to glucose. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the glucose molecule, which is a six carbon molecule, and we're going to convert it into a pruic acid molecule, which is a three carbon molecule. So tying this process back together with photosynthesis, that you probably got in biology, is plants store energy for the rest of the biological world through photosynthesis by making the sugar molecule. So what the plant does is take light energy and store it in the bonds between carbon and the sugar. So if we begin to break the bonds between carbons down, we can we can release the we can release the potential energy that the plant stored in the sugar molecule and convert it to kinetic energy that we can use to accomplish something. And that's exactly what this process does. It takes the sugar molecule, converts it into two three carbon compounds, breaks a carbon carbon bond. That's exactly how you drove to school today. Is your car just designed to break carbon carbon bonds? to recover stored energy in the carbon carbon bond that's in the gasoline to drive your car. So we're doing the same process. We're just doing it a little different. Your car needs oxygen. You need oxygen. Just a little different process. All right. So at the end product, we're going to get two ATP. All right. So if you have abundant oxygen, then the pruvic acid is going to be used in cellular respiration. And that requires a mitochondria. And you can make 36 ATP out of your mitochondria. So if you don't have oxygen, so you're glycolytic, and you don't have abundant, you don't have abundant mitochondria, then what you're going to do is take your, your fruitic acid, and because you've got to free up some molecules to continue the process, you're going to convert your pruric acid and lactic acid and put it into your blood. And then that allows you to still make two ATP per glucose molecule. So there's kind of two strategies that the fibers that we just talked about use. So fast glycolytic fibers are experts at this. They're, they're, they're great if they have a little oxygen because they do have a few mitochondria. So in the first part of contractibility, they can make 38 ATP. But as soon as they enter oxygen down, and they're back to only doing this process. And if pruvic acid builds up in the cell, the process will shut down, so they convert to lactic acid part of the blood. So for years, we thought lactic acid build up in muscle, which is why muscles got sore after exercise, and we know that's not true at all anymore. The lactic acid is quickly transferred to the blood, and it and can be quickly used by cardiac muscle and brain cells to generate ATP. So, so it's not the buildup of lactic acid that, that results in, in muscle uh, soreness. It's actually the destruction of sarcomeres that you have to rebuild. Yeah. It results in muscle soreness, muscle overstretching. All right. So 
in thinking about what we just talked about then, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at the process that in, in a stepwise fashion. So just as we said, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, starting with a glucose molecule that is a six carbon compound. So we're going to start with glucose that is made up of six carbons. And what we're going to do is convert that, and we're going to start with one of those. We're going to convert that to two peruvic acid molecules, which are three carbon molecules. And what we're essentially going to do is we're going to break a carbon-carbon bond, harness the energy out of the carbon-carbon bond uh, to do some work with this. Okay. So the first thing that we kind of need to understand is there's no free lunch. So you can't even start this process unless you use a little energy. So we're actually going to use 2 ATP and convert it to ADP. And what we're going to do is we're going to transfer the phosphate to the sugar molecule, which makes it unstable and we can actually break it down. So if I was going to do all that stuff in detail, we'd go throughout the part. We're going to do that later in class. So right now I just want to kind of understand that process. So the other thing we need to review is that the bonds between carbon and carbon are what kind of bonds? Are they ionic or are they covalent? They're covalent. And covalent bonds are sharing of electrons. So in essence, when we break a bond, we have electrons to deal with. Okay? And so what we're going to see is that we can actually harness these electrons and the energy of the electrons to also help us make ATP. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with two ATP so we're going to use a little energy to get the system started. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to make 4 ATP out of phosphate. Uh, yeah. And we're going to make 4 ATP. So then our name gain to our cell is 4 ATP that we generate minus 2 ATP that we actually use. So then our gain to the cell at this point is 2 ATP. So that's what you see at the top is this 2 ATP. Yes? Look at that part 4. Sorry, ATP. So you have to have 4 ATP plus 4 phosphate to make the 4 ATP. So the reason why we're doing it is that the phosphate bonds are where we store energy. And so we have three phosphates that we put together. And this last bond uh, is the high energy bond. So what we typically do is just take one phosphate off. So we get ADP, and then we store energy by making it ATP. And then there, there's the molecule has a shape. And I, uh, years ago, I used to remember the shape from the top of my head, so now I just remember it like this. ATP. ATP. All right. So remember what we said is we have these electrons. And when we look at a when we look at a carbohydrate like sugar, then what we have is we have sugar with hydrogens bonded. Now if you look at the periodic table, carbon is under 14 there, hydrogen is over under one. So carbon is a giant molecule. It has a lot more protons than hydrogen. So essentially when you put hydrogen and carbon together, carbon still is the electrons. Okay. 
So what we do is we denote the fact that these electrons that are going to come out of this bond breakage are actually from hydrogen themselves. And so what we need is we need a molecule that can carry the electrons that we call NAD. And then what we're going to do is say, well, what we're actually going to form then is a molecule called NADH. And then the H is telling us the electrons are and so what we need is we need we need two NADs and we're going to make two NADHs. And then these NADHs are going to go somewhere else to make energy up within the mitochondria. Okay. All right. So pruvic acid as it enters the mitochondria is converted to a two-carbon compound. So the two-carbon compound is called acetyl-CoA. And it's a two carbon compound. And there's two of them. So essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to break another carbon bond. This time, we're going to end up with a free carbon. And so the carbon is going to be given off as a waste product as carbon dioxide. And since we're going to form one carbon dioxide per acetyl CoA, we're actually going to give off two carbon dioxides at this point. So, what do we do with the carbon dioxide? Get rid of it. We put it in our blood, we take it to our lungs, and we put it out in the atmosphere. And then plants love us. They want to come hug us. Because the carbon dioxide is what they need to make more sugar. Keep this whole song process going. And then while they make more sugar, they make oxygen. I always wondered about a society that builds giant concrete parking lots where plants used to be. Because parking lots do not do photosynthesis and make oxygen and reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, we walk further, we give off more carbon dioxide so the plants can make more oxygen. So we don't actually have a high enough energy bond to make any ATP directly out of this process. But because we broke bonds, we have electrons. And so since we have electrons, then we can actually generate some more of this NAD stuff. So we're going to use two NADs, and we're going to convert those two NADs to two NADHs. And then the NADHs are going to go over here, where we can generate more energy. Okay. So, so within the mitochondria, the acetyl-CoA enters this this cyclic biochemical event called the Krebs cycle. So Krebs, Hans Krebs, was the biochemist that figured it out. It's a cycle because we start with a molecule that we add the acetyl-CoA to, we break down the acetyl-CoA, and we recover the exact same molecules that we started the reaction with. And we can use it again and again and again and again. So that's why it's called a cycle. It's a beautiful example of, of recycling in, in a way that is energy efficient. And so what we're going to do is we're going to attach the acetyl-CoA to this molecule, and then eventually what we're going to do is break the acetyl-CoA completely down so what we're going to end up with is the release of four carbon dioxides, two per acetyl coating molecule. So remember, we started with six carbons here. We have two carbon dioxide here. We have four carbon dioxide here. So now we've just accounted for all of our carbon. And we've completely now high, uh, broke, broke down our sugar molecule. When we do that, we end up with we end up with um, with enough energy to actually generate uh, two ATP. And it is always a, I guess I don't know. what we actually do is we make two GTP, which is an altered form of molecule, and we actually put the convert that to two ATP. Little white lies. So, just remember the two ATP. 
you do, you actually do produce this GTP first. Okay. And then what we're going to do then is we're going to make six NADHs. And we're going to use somewhere else to make energy. And we're actually going to collect two electrons at a lower energy level. And so the end product of it then is going to be also two six NADHs and two FADH. Right. So at the end product now, we've, we've got our carbon dioxide, and the molecule's now completely broken down. So we went from glucose to peruvic acid, gas to go to two, six carbon, three carbon, two carbon, and no carbons. They're all in the carbon dioxide molecules. So our end product out of this was our 6O2. At this point, we've actually generated only four ATP. So the biggest way we make ATP is actually using those electrons. Okay? So let's just do a quick review of some things we just talked about before we go on to some. So glycolysis, which occurs in the cell cytoplasm, is the way in which we're going to take sugar, the glucose molecule, and convert it to these these three carbon compounds that we call peruvic acid. And as I indicated, we use ATP because we're going to convert, we're going to put the phosphate on the sugar molecule, which is going to help us break it down. So what we are actually going to end up with is two column molecules of peruvic acid. We're going to end up with the production of two net ATP, and we're going to actually produce two of those NADHs that are on the board there. So then as the peruvic acid passes into the mitochondria, it's actually going to be converted from peruvic acid to acetylcholine. When we do that, we're going to spin off carbon dioxide because we have gone from a three-carbon compound to a two-carbon compound. Uh, and then the waste product is carbon dioxide. And then we're actually not going to generate any ATP uh, because we didn't have a high enough energy bond to do that with. So what we're actually going to do is make two NADHs uh, that we can use later to, to make energy. <coughs> so in the Krebs cycle, what we're going to do is we're going to actually attach the acetylcholine molecule. We're going to, it's going to go through a series of biochemical modifications that are allow us to break off the carbon molecules, and then we're going to recover the same molecule. And in doing so, we're going to generate four carbon dioxide. So now our six carbon dioxides are accounted for. All of our carbons and our sugar now are being converted to carbon dioxide. We're actually going to make six NADHs that we can make energy out of. We're going to do uh, two FADHs. And then we're going to make two GTP that's quickly converted to ATP. All right, so the next step is taking those electrons and harnessing energy out of electrons. And electrons possess energy, and as they possess energy, they can get further and further away from the nucleus of the atom. So what happens is we can actually transfer electrons from one, well, one atom to another atom. So if we if we reduce the number of electrons in one atom, we oxidize it. And if we add electrons to another atom, we reduce it. So if we give off electrons, that's an oxidation. We remove more electrons. If we add electrons to a molecule, it's a reduction. So the electron transport system is a oxidation re reduction reaction where we use electrons, transfer electrons between molecules, and actually harness energy out of the process. So, so the real enchilada looks like this. We actually have internal membranes in our mitochondria. We actually have proteins embedded in the internal membranes in our mitochondria that we can oxidize and reduce molecules. And then eventually what we can do is we can pass all of the hydrogen ions 
that were associated with these electrons down through a hydrogen pump. And we can use the hydrogen pump to generate ATP. Well, that's a biochemical analysis. So what I always like to do is do an, an, an analogy to that. And because right now I'm more interested in you knowing the, the mathematics of it than, than the biochemistry behind it. So what we can do is we can take that same idea and we can say, really, it's like a stair step event. And what we're going to have is molecules involved, uh, cytochromes and other molecules involved. And it's kind of a six-step process. And the electrons up here are going to end up, are going to enter this in high energy. And at the end of the process, the electrons are going to end up in, here, in low energy. Long story short, the electrons actually belong to hydrogen. So the hydrogen ion without an electron is H plus. So what we're essentially going to do down here is take our hydrogen ions, recombine them with their electrons, and then once we have the hydrogen, we're going to combine that with oxygen to make water. So we metabolically make water. Pretty cool. Yeah. At the end of the process. Then what does plant need to do to make this over again? It needs water and carbon dioxide. All right. So NAD enters here. And Every two of these steps generates an ATP. So the take home message is for each NADH to generate three ATP. Now FADH actually is carrying electrons at lower energy rate. So in this analogy, it would enter here. And then FADH only creates two ATP. So then we just have to think about where everything came from. So how many NADHs did we make from glycolysis? So two NADHs. So how many ATP are we going to make in electron transfer? Six ATP. So the next one was conversion of peruvic acid to acetyl CoA. And how many how many NADH are we doing? Two NADH. So how many ATP are we doing? Six ATP. So the next step was the Krebs cycle. <coughs> so with the Krebs cycle, we're going to, how many did we make? Six NADHs. How many ATP are we going to make? <laughs> 18 ATP. So, from our NADH, we're going to make 12 plus 18. Thirty. Thirty ATP. So and there's variations of this, that's why in textbooks you can see. Uh, 36 or 38 ATP. So I'm just using the upper number for a little scenario here. So where did we make our NADF, DNA, DH2s? Crap cycle. And how many did we make? Two. So, so we made two FADH. We convert back to how many ATP? Four. Four ATP over here. So then from FADH2, we make 
four ATP. So our total right now from the electron transport system is 34 ATP. How many do we make directly from glycolysis? Two. Two. So that would make it 36 ATP. How many do we make directly from the Krebs cycle? Two. So makes it 38 ATP. So we had two ATP from glycolysis. And we had two ATP from Krebs. And we get a total of 38 ATP. So now how many power strokes can you do? To accomplish a muscle contraction. 38. <laughs> so muscles use a bunch of energy. Which is why if you tie exercise to any way you want to lose weight, you can lose weight. So the way to think about it is we stuff pie in our mouth so we have sugar to drive muscle. 